So welcome everybody to uh, this session of Let's Build an AI Ready Data Center. I'm Chris Sear, CTO of Sterling, and I have with me my Director of Innovation and Technology, Ira Barjan. And with that, I'm not going to get heavy on introductions, but uh, let's get started on this. So when you take a look at this first slide, this is kind of one of those old uh, childhood things of spot the difference. You know, you could find uh, five or six differences in these photos. Uh, take a couple seconds and, and take a look at it and see if you can spot the difference between these two. Well, guess what, folks? They're the same. And the reason why this is really important is because an AI-ready data center is very difficult to be able to detect when just looking at the equipment. There are a lot of different facets involved in designing and operating an AI-ready data center. And so while you have one that looks exactly like the picture that is shown twice up on the slide, that could really just be used for enterprise workloads or it could be used for AI workloads. And if you don't know the difference between the two, in this session, we'll kind of discuss that. Ira and I will talk a little bit about that. Um, but really what we're here is to kind of give you a scenario on what the future of artificial intelligence is and also give you some ideas as to how to be able to move forward with this uh, within your organization to be able to drive impressive and incredible insights into the data that you might already have or the data that you're looking to obtain. So for today's agenda, uh, for the next hour, we're going to talk a little bit about getting back to basics. When we get involved with things like data centers, there's a lot of the basics that, you know, people that are involved in this career, we, we tend to spend a lot of our time uh, not necessarily the most exciting subjects, but power and cooling, um, network, storage, and compute. I mean, they all work together to form this, this perfect balance when it's designed properly. And, uh, and one of the big things is we have to understand the industry in order for us to be able to get into, you know, the importance of power and cooling and the others. So if you'll notice around uh, the news today, uh, around the barbecue, around all the different discussions that, that myself and my peers have been having. It's really about this is the year that I think AI is going to become more prevalent and more uh, in use in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, there is an, a conversation I have pretty much either every day or, or at least once a week talking about some new artificial intelligence tool that does you know, amazing things. Like if you're a gardener, you can look at a plant, identify the plant, give it its nutritional information, see if it's overwatered, underwatered, too much sun. Um, really a, a, you know, amazing insights that we normally would not have been able to do. Um, but, uh, and of course, you know, the latest news on the investments that Google and Microsoft have been making within their uh, conversational uh, um, you know, artificial intelligence tool set. That being said, the market is going to be, uh, I don't necessarily want to say gigantic, but it's, it's going to be very big, 125 billion by 2025. And so this market is going to uh, bring an awful lot of new technology, uh, new hardware, new software, uh, new solutions to be able to, uh, to grow your business or your agency. Um, one of the things that I hear all the time is, uh, when customers come to Sterling, they start talking about artificial intelligence and they'll say something like, well, we want to start using artificial intelligence to expand our business or grow our market share or solve problems that they normally wouldn't be able to solve with normal com computation. And so the one question that I always wind up asking them is, is, is your existing data center ready to handle an AI workload? Ira, do you tend to ask other questions when people you know, tend to say, hey, I want some of that AI? Yeah, absolutely. So um, network speeds, I mean, are you using InfiniBand, are you using Ethernet? Um, is you, you know, do you have the correct amount of data? Have you, do you have governance around that data? Can you properly store that data to be consumed by your computing platforms, either that be a GPU or CPU? So, there are many you know, different questions we can ask someone. Uh, so what, what it allows us to do is to continue this, this, uh, this discussion about what an AI ready data center is. You know, one of the things that you gotta start looking at is, uh, you know, there are enterprise workloads and there are artificial intelligence workloads. 
And while you may not understand all the aspects of it, um, you know, here are the top three that are currently being used today and some other ones that are, that are emerging, um, one of which is machine learning. Um, you know, and, and Ira, in the machine learning space, I mean, we always, we always hear it, you know, you, you read it, it says ML slash AI, but it's really more of a subset, don't you think? Yeah, I mean, to, to me, there's three subsets within machine learning, and that'd be classification, regression, and clustering. So classification, that can be something as simple as a financial institution uh, determining if a um, transaction is fraudulent or not fraudulent. You know, that's an example of binary classification. With regression, you know, we're looking at something over a continuous value. So a, you could use this for sales forecasting based off a set of different features within a data set. With clustering, you know, is that third area and that's being able to group points within a data set based off a set of attributes. Yeah, so you know, you would think that clustering would would come in handy uh, in marketing. Um, that uh, you know, clustering might also be be used for uh, response to disasters based upon geographic areas, uh, things along uh, the space of um, you know retirement homes and the age in the age groups of of that, or even if you're doing medical research, people that have particular symptoms, you could, you could cluster those as well. Um, you know, so, so there are some really interesting aspects in that, in that space. The, the other one is, that's kind of near and dear to my heart, I've been working within a digital human realm for, for a couple of years now, um, and it's tied directly into NLP, or natural language processing. Um, you know, we use that a lot. I use it a lot. My voice assistants, you know, whether I'm turning lights on, turning lights off, whether I'm ordering something, or whether I'm trying to navigate through, through a busy, uh, busy city. Um, but there's a lot more coming down the pipe where, you know, humans are going to be talking to, uh, you know, digital versions of humans to have conversations in their everyday life such as how do I get to this gate at the airport? Can I get a cup of coffee? Um, and sometimes a cup of coffee might just be a cup of coffee at McDonald's or, or some other you know, shop, or if it's a very specific type of coffee that they want. And with that requires a lot of compute uh, power uh, to be able to you know, tell the difference between that. The other interesting thing is being able to classify sentiment. Being able to analyze the sentiment that's being used in the either in the written word or in the spoken word, and with that comes uh, you know a version of digital empathy. Um, you know, utilizing AI can help a nurse uh, be able to talk to a child in a different manner. You could have a digital nurse that could be looking at that particular child and notice that first of all, maybe that child doesn't speak English and it needs to switch to a language that they would understand. Uh, also, because they're a child, they're being spoken in a different way. Uh, it could also have something to do with the procedure that would take place. Maybe it's an IV being inserted for the first time and the child's never had that, and that child is afraid. And being able to recognize that and speak in a particular way um, becomes you know, massively important. And I think that you know, that's an AI workload that is going to be used more and more and more as we start to, you know, to put this into mainstream. Um, and then, you know, as we start looking at uh, computer vision, you know, Ira, you know, we've, we've spent a lot of time in that space. Um, but what are some things that you, that you think are becoming more and more important in that area? Yeah, I mean, it's, there's a ton of work out there around computer vision. Um, if you look at something as simple as object detection, um, think about your Roomba, you know, look at the work that, you know, Boston Dynamics is doing around robotics. Um, think about drone, you know, we're actually using a model to determine visually that this object is a book, this object is a television and this box, you know, this object is a laptop. So there's tons of practical use cases around image or excuse me, object detection. Uh, image classification, I saw a really interesting um, video on a 
uh, company that developed a solution for agriculture. So we're able to fly drones over a farm and determine which, which crops are failing, which crops are doing good, which crops are growing great, which crops are not growing great, and then be able to use that data to pinpoint the application of fertilizer or pinpoint the application of pesticides. And that's great because that you know, reduces costs for the farmer, but it also reduces the environmental impact we have from you know, adding or creating additives into the soil. Um, with semantic segmentation, that's another very interesting area within um, computer vision. And what we're doing there is we are determining at the pixel level which pixels are part of which different objects. So this is what's used in autonomous vehicles. So as the autonomous vehicle you know, drives on the street, it has a visual understanding of this is the road, this is the sidewalk, these are the people, these are different you know, objects that can move in its way. Um, and this is also used in manufacturing, uh, being able to see you know, at a high speed you know, which products are, you know, not perfect, which parts are not perfectly orientated on the assembly line and be able, being able to make decisions based on the data that it sees. Um, Chris, you've seen some stuff around image generation. Yeah, I have, um, you know, uh, our marketing department, you know, there's a lot of times when I have to do a presentation uh, and I'll do a request and I'll say, I need you know, I need somebody uh, dressed in a suit. I need an image of somebody dressed in a suit that's drowning in a sea of technology. You know, struggling to get its head to get their head above water. And the amount of time that it would take to you know create that in an art program to be able to you know iterate on that and and give me three or four different options to see what I you know what I think would be good for my presentation or I just do just what I said and type that in to a, you know to an AI image generator, and then it gives me five different options on what I what I look at. Now they're not perfect, you know. I run, you know, if you, if you haven't played with it, uh, there's some interesting things that they, that they cannot do, but um, but it's still early days. I think there's going to be some some really amazing things, you know, moving forward with that. So. Um, you know, uh, not just image generation, but, uh, but content generation too. Um, I think it's going to change the way that, that we educate. You know, I think, um, I, I think we could accelerate uh, some of our paths uh, in, in some of our disciplines. Uh, you know, especially when, you know, a scientist is trying to explain uh, something to an eighth grader. Uh, somebody, you know, you, there, you can take a, a technical topic like, uh, you know, explain a, a quantum computer to an eighth grader or explain a quantum computer to a fifth grader. Um, and uh, it's, there's some amazing tool sets that are, that are coming out in that space. But, you know, Ira, as, as you and I have said, you know, while that is amazing technology and it's, and it's in the front end and we're looking at this, there is so much that is happening on the back end in those data centers to be able to produce that. Absolutely. I mean, that's as we go into storage, networking, um, and compute, I mean, it's all required to consume all this data that we're referring yeah. to. You know, so throughout my years of my relationship with NVIDIA, um, you know, I, I, I've seen them go from heavy, heavy in the hardware side, the chipsets uh, within the GPU, um, and, you know, and, and through the years, there's been a lot of development within the software space. You know, they're, they, they're now a software company. They've developed, uh, you know, a very large set of SDKs that do amazing things. So Omniverse, while it is a collaborative tool, has the capability of being able to assist in the creation of AI workloads and could definitely be an important factor when designing an AI-ready data center. Don't you agree? Yes, absolutely. So Omniverse can be used, you know, given it's a collaborative tool, um, you know, and we're, you know, collaborating to draw these, these large-scale plants or whatever. Um, we can use that information to generate training data 
for our models, which we'll use in our autonomous vehicles. So if you think about like a, a manufacturing plant, so NVIDIA used the BMW plant in Spartanburg, South Carolina, as an example, um, they use uh, Omniverse to develop training data to train these autonomous robots. So they understood, you know, what are the correct pathways to use? So I think that's great. That's where we're seeing, you know, the merge of Omniverse and machine learning. No, that's great. That's a really interesting insight. You know, and so as you start to look at how this is going to affect your organization, you know, there's a lot of steps that you have to do before you even begin to run that very first AI workload. And so one of the big important things is nothing gets done without electricity. So power tends to become, you know, the, the unspoken, you know, feed that, 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 takes, uh, that takes place inside of a data center. But there's a lot of planning that comes into play when you're starting to look at artificial intelligence workloads. And the first thing that you have to do when you're doing something like this in an existing data center is you have to map your current consumption. Now, if you're not currently doing that, what this entails is going line by line, rack by rack, you know, uh, object by object, and plotting out your power consumption, whether it's network switches, top of rack, whether it's storage, whether it is uh, you know, uh, regular servers, whether it is um, you know, the, the power uh, that's, that's supplying your cooling systems. Once you have that mapped out, then at least you know your baseline. And, the, and then what you do from that point is as you calculate that, you have to look at your future requirements. And you know, Ira, we were talking about this, um, uh, you know, a, a regular, uh, you know, regular 2U server probably consumes, you know, a kilowatt, maybe a little bit over a kilowatt, you know, of electricity. And uh, when we were looking at the, the H100 DGX, uh, what, was the, what was the consumption on that? It was... Uh, it was yeah, it was approximately 10.2 kilowatts for one yeah. server. So yeah, then that server has a GPU, so um, it consumes a lot of power. Right. So you're now looking at, a, you know, if you're looking at a 2U server that's burning a kilowatt, and then you're taking a DGX that burns 10 times that amount, you have to really start to look at your planning. And then on top of that, you have to look at, you know, whether you might need to upgrade uh, any of the cabling, any of the breakers, the supply that's going in, if you have, you know, 20 amp supply or 30 amp supply, if you're running, you know, different phase of power, different voltages of power, um, are, the, are the PDUs inside of your rack capable of supporting the electricity that you need to be able to provide? Uh, and then on top of that, you know, are you also matching your backup power, you know? Um, you know, one of the things that we that we have experienced has been, you know, in our in in my career, we've lost, uh, you know, total power inside of a data center, uh, and then our backup power, while we thought had enough uh, you know, storage, you know, uh, battery, right, to be able to to be able to support that, uh, wound up uh, being consumed a lot faster because we didn't map our current consumption. Did you ever run into that? Did you ever have to like? Uh, you know, beat the clock to try and uh, back up systems before, you know, being able to restore power? Absolutely. Or simply when the UP de excuse me, the UPS doesn't work. So there's been tons of issues with power in every data center I've worked in. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and so, you know, how do you measure it? There's, uh, there's a, lot of different, um, a lot of different algorithms or, or, or you know, formulas that, that people use. Um, one of the ones that I've been looking at has been, uh, has been the PUE concept. Um, really what's kind of neat is you, uh, you know, you measure the amount of power that you currently are using inside of your data center. Um, and then once you have that baseline, that becomes your PUE of one. And then what you do is as you start to bring in future, uh, pieces of equipment, like, I don't know, maybe you have, you know, a thousand Watts coming in. Of, uh, of power consumption, if your PUE jumps to say 2.0 or to a, a, a value of two, then for every thousand watts that you are bringing in for that compute, you need to have an additional thousand watts of cooling and lighting and things along those lines in order to be able to, um, to associate it. 
So when you're looking at power efficiency uh, across the entire, uh, entire realm or ecosystem in, of your data center, uh, power uh, becomes extremely important. And it also becomes extremely expensive if you don't have all of the things that we talked about to be able to handle the AI workloads. Um, on the bottom of the screen is a really cool tool. It's um, made by Schneider Electric. Uh, they're one of our partners as well in the data center space. Uh, and uh, it's a really interesting tool that helps you map out your current power usage and lets you uh, determine what your PUE uh, would be inside of that data center. So then when we go from power, you know, I mentioned it before, is cooling. And the thing about AI uh, workloads is that they generate immense amounts of heat. Uh, you know, they're, they're constantly working at the, at the peak levels of, uh, of computational operations. And so they generate an awful lot of heat. And if your data center is not used to being able to run at those high temperatures, then you really have to start looking at your cooling. Um, you know, you have air conditioning units, of course, they're much bigger and a lot more expensive than, say, a window unit, you know, that you're trying to put in your, in your bedroom that you pick up at Lowe's. Uh, air handlers that, that blow, you know, massive amounts of air under the floor uh, and up through the racks to be able to cool everything. Uh, you know, they take up a lot of space. Uh, they do have a cost associated with it. Um, and there's some new innovative ways of being able to use liquid cooling, um, both immersive and, you know, like a closed circuit liquid cooling system to be able to drive that heat down. Um, of course, when you're looking at cooling systems, you should also be looking at the amount of power that it creates. Um, you know, is there anything that you wanted, to, you wanted to add there? I know we, we used to go into data centers and they'd be freezing, but, uh, but lately I've been going into data centers and I've been walking into a lot more hot zones. Yeah, I've actually, I think that's a trend now. I just saw uh, a briefing on a data center in Europe where they were actually just using convection and expelling the heat outside because the temperatures in that area were, were quite cold, so they were actually not using that much cooling. So I think there are different trends um, compared to what was done in the past. Yeah. And Ira, you know, in our data center, in our solution center, didn't we have the opposite problem? Where we, like, yeah. we weren't generating enough heat and it was actually causing our cooling system to malfunction, correct? Yeah, absolutely. So if your cooling system isn't properly uh, solutioned or architected, you actually could run into the issue where you're not generating enough heat, which causes the AC unit to actually freeze over because there's not enough load for it to cool. Wow. Yeah, that kind of freaked me out the first time that I saw that. And so now what we're doing is uh, we're making sure that our systems are warm enough, right? <laughs> To where, yeah. to where our system can cool. Well, hopefully, as we start you know, putting more AI workloads to, uh, to work in our data center, we won't have that problem anymore. Um, the other thing, too, is when, you know, when your cooling goes out, you also have to plan for redundancy. So it's not just one cooling system that you should be looking at. You should have an ability to, uh, to be able to continue to cool in the event your primary uh, cooling system goes down. So you may not be able to do that now, um, but, uh, but there are designs in place to be able to get that to, uh, to be able to work. And then the other thing too is monitoring and maintaining those cooling systems. Um, you know, if you're not changing filters, if you're not removing, you know, the dust or anything that, that goes across those coils or any periodic maintenance, um, then, you know, that can greatly affect your capability of your systems to cool. The other thing is you should also, you know, monitor, you know, the, these, these cooling systems are, you know, network connected. They have consoles, they have data that you can log and you can actually see like what is happening inside your, your cooling system and maybe um, be able to plan uh, for, you know, for when you're adding these AI workloads that you have enough capacity to be able to do so. So power and cooling, big dance, uh, finding the right balance is key. Uh, there are you know, costs associated with that, but, um, you know, but then once you have that up, the racks are connected, the cooling system is in place, you got it at a really nice cold temperature with, uh, with the right amount of, uh, of humidity, that's when 
you start to lay down some of the infrastructure. And some of that infrastructure that becomes extremely important is networking. Now, you know, I talk about networking because running an AI workload is very different than running an enterprise workload. And the networks associated with it um, are a little bit different. You know, an enterprise workload uh, can, you know, can, can run within, you know, a 10 gig uh, switch. Uh, it can run on copper cable. It can run, you know, just whatever type of performance and cost balance that you want to be able to run that is okay for your business. Um, you know, the delay might be, uh, might be okay for, you know, for an organization. But when you're starting to run artificial intelligence workloads, when these jobs could run for, you know, not just minutes, but for hours, days, and weeks, it becomes extremely important to have a very resilient, high-speed, um, you know, network that is uh, capable of being able to, you know, feed the beast, right? And when I say feed the beast, Ira, what, what, what do I mean by that? We kind of laughed about it when we started talking. Yeah, so machine learning is, is data-driven. So in order for these models to generalize, we need to feed them with as much data as possible. Um, so that requires, you know, you know, very high network speeds. And you can look at, you know, standard Ethernet versus InfiniBand. InfiniBand is a lot less latency um, and in some cases more throughput too. So latency throughput feeding these, these GPUs as we scale out, um, yeah, that's just going to require a lot more bandwidth and a lower latency. And we run, this, uh, we run into these scenarios where people uh, inside the data center think that, that their network is robust enough that they have the capability of being able to, you know, pump large amount of data across their across their backbone, and they find out that the bandwidth isn't isn't enough, or the or buffering starts to take place. They've exceeded the capacity and capability of their network, and it's something that really needs to be considered. So, you know, we've talked about the power and the cooling. Um, you know, Nvidia has an entire line of networking tools um, that can run both Ethernet and and uh, and Finiband uh, on their Mellanox line. Um, they're, you know, they're kind of industry leaders when it comes to those uh, very high speed networks to be able to run this type. And, um, and the neat thing about it is that, you know, they allow you to choose your topology. So they're not making you go to InfiniBand. If you have, uh, you know, staff that are fully well versed in, in the Ethernet world, uh, they can do that, but if you wanted to be able to switch, you could with with very you know little impact, uh, right, Ira? Yep, absolutely. I mean, some of these, as you just said, some of these cards can run both both protocols, so um, it can be you know not that more not that much of a difficult uh, step to switch between the two. And then cabling becomes a really big uh, important issue as well. You know, it's something very basic, but. Uh, you know, there's a big difference between a budget, you know, cable versus, uh, you know, versus fully, you know, certified, uh, you know, cable from, from uh, you know, higher quality vendors. Um, one of the things that, that I wound up running into was trying to tell the difference between a Cat5 and a Cat6 cable. You know, they both look, both look the same, but they have different characteristics. And, uh, you know, and, and with that, I mean, it's, it's not just that, but it's also even if you're looking in terms of fiber, you know, using single mode, multi-mode, using, um, you know, some of the lower priced uh, fiber, I've seen them, you know, crack and split and things along those, uh, in, in those areas. Um, but the other thing that a lot of people tend to look past is port density. You know, if, if you have the capability of being able to have you know, 64 ports versus 48 in the same space, then there's a lot of flexibility when it comes to things like this. And, you know, and, and then on top of that, it's, it's the cost to operate. And it's not just the cost to purchase, but you should look at support costs. You should look at, you know, uh, tr you know training costs. You should look at, uh, you know, being able to operate uh, a new console, if you will, or if you've got, a bunch of different vendors inside your enterprise network, you know, you should look at, you know, consolidating into 
a little bit more of a, you know, more of a, uh, I won't say single vendor solution, but more, more of a reduced vendor solution that is more compatible to being able to run these workloads. So now that we've got the network kind of taken care of, um, you know, and we've, we've figured out the topology and why we need to be looking at the different, uh, the different capabilities of pumping that data quickly across that medium into those GPUs, now we've got to figure out, well, where is all that data coming from? And so storage plays a major role inside of an AI-ready data center. You know, a lot of times I have conversations with, uh, you know, with, with people about storage and a lot of people sometimes feel, well, data is, uh, you know, it's just ones and zeros, right, Ira? I mean, you know, <laughs> JPEG, you know, movie file, it doesn't really matter. It's just ones and zeros. And, um, and then you get into the difference between block and object storage. And then, you know, you, you really start, you know, taking a look at, well, why is a lot of this important? Well, if you look at enterprise workloads, you know, a lot of times you're building for capacity and growth because, you know, your data is constantly uh, growing and sometimes the purchases are, you know, take place in years. Um, the other thing is that you're, you're looking for that balance of, you know, cost and performance and capacity. But when you start looking at running an AI workload, you really need the most performant type of storage that you can that you can find and that you can afford and you know one of the things that i tend to tell my customers is if it if it winds up be, being you have to weigh capacity versus performance and you have to stay within a particular budget performance will win every time you know there's there's ways of being able to you know optimize the way you're utilizing your capacity and so um, there's a lot of different options inside of uh, instead of storage, side of storage platforms, there's best practices across all the major, you know, storage providers. But if you're not building your storage to be able to handle those AI workloads, get it across a fast enough network and get it into those GPUs. If you haven't considered those design constraints, then I urge you to to take a look at that. Um, it, it's very different than what a lot of people are used to in running in, uh, in an enterprise data center. Uh, Ira, what do, you, what do you think about that? Yeah, so artificial intelligence and machine learning, they're both data driven. So we are trying to take data and make decisions based off that data. So as we gather more data to, to train these models, uh, we definitely need capacity. The flip side on performance, you know, as we add more GPUs to a system, that requires us to be able to pull out more data from our storage system. So um, not all storage arrays uh, are performant as we scale out from four GPUs to eight GPUs to 16 to 1,000. So looking at it from a performance standpoint, can your storage actually scale as you scale GPUs is key. And also from a capacity standpoint, we're trying to pull in all this data. We need you know larger capacities. And as Chris just pointed out, Sometimes there's like a balance between, you know, capacity and storage. We'll look at tiering. You could have a slower storage for your data lake, and as you pull in data to train, put it on your high speed storage. Yeah, that's a great point. That's a that's a really great point. And um, you know, and, and so you know, we have we have these discussions with our customers all the time. Um, sometimes you know. What we really try to do is look for better ways to be able to optimize what they're currently using. And if, uh, and if there is a way for us to be able to talk to them about you know, moving those workloads into, into much uh, you know, you know, more cost-effective areas. I mean, you're not, if you're storing images and you're not really using them all the time, there's no sense in putting it in a very expensive, high-performance you know, storage array. So um, that becomes really, really important. So now that we've got the network and now that we've got the storage, you know, next comes, you know, what, what really where the rubber, you know, uh, meets the road. And it's, you know, there's CPUs, GPUs, and DPUs now, right? And like in my career, just when I got the hang of like all the different types of CPU, whether it was, uh, you know, Spark or Power or ARM or, you know, uh, the x86 platforms from Intel and AMD, you know, once I got all that done, 
all of a sudden here comes NVIDIA with their, with their GPUs and when you start looking at the, at the performance characteristics of the GPUs, you know, there's, there's a whole ecosystem inside of that. Um, and now, you know, we're, they're, they're taking that to the next level and they're, and they're creating these, these data processing units um, that are, you know, that are really kind of uh, shifting what we're doing in, in AI to, uh, to being able to optimize uh, these models when minutes mean millions. And so, you know, Ira, you know, I know we're really excited about, you know, the Bluefield 2, uh, you know, units, um, but, but if you take into consideration the advances with what Invi where NVIDIA has gone from, you know, their previous generation of GPUs in a DGX to where they are now, it's pretty incredible. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the GPU technology is increasing. It's like astonishing how fast, you know, the performance leaps you get year to year. On the DPU side, I think that's one of the more exciting pieces of hardware for me personally. You know, being able to take those functions that were, you know, used in an operating system for storage and networking and be able to offset those to a separate card allows us to have more bare metal performance. So I think it's really exciting technology that's came out in this last year. Yep. And it's something that I think as people are starting to, you know, think about their AI ready workload, where those fit. And the, the interesting thing is that the DPUs are actually more energy efficient. Um, and, uh, you know, which falls in line, like what we were talking about before, and the power and the cooling and, and building this entire ecosystem. Um, there's a lot more to be, uh, to be spoken about this. You know, there's different libraries, um, you know, running things, uh, you know, in the compute environment, um, you know, can be, can be utilized that way. Uh, GPUs are, you know, ultimately faster. Um, but then as you start looking at optimizing these workloads, DPUs can, can fit a particular area uh, and do some really amazing things. So if you haven't seen anything about the Bluefield 2 uh, uh, DPU, I'm sure there's some sessions that, uh, that will go over it. And I know I'm, I'm going to be involved in, in, in watching some of those as well as Ira. So, uh, you know, take a look at the catalog and, and see what, what you can see when it comes to that type of technology. You know, so, so we've gone back to the basics, right? We've, we've looked at the, uh, you know, the power, the cooling, uh, the network, the storage. We've, we've looked at, you know, the different architectures within the compute, you know, sides of it. But there are also other aspects of an AI-ready data center. And, you know, one of the things is as you start to run these workloads, you got to start asking some questions. Like, this is secure, right? We, you know, we, 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 uh, we're protecting our data. We're uh, okay against ransomware. We're, uh, you know, we're, we're looking at uh, our endpoint security as we, as we start to tie into these models as they become operationalized. Um, you know, what do you think? Uh, have, have we, we haven't really had a whole lot of discussions about security within artificial intelligence. No, we haven't. And I think you bring up some key points on this slide. You know, as again, as we said earlier, this is all data driven. So we're starting to pull in more data. Um, what if that data has PII? In it? How do you mask that? What are the compliance, you know, the compliance requirements around that? Um, does your, you know, governing body have some security requirements? Does the data have to be encrypted? You know, what are the access rights to that data? So I think it brings up a lot of security and compliance questions that definitely need to be answered. I think all of this falls under governance. So do you have a great governance model for the data that you're pulling in um, will be key in these newer type of architectures. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, one of the other things too that we, that, that I'm starting to see, like in my discussions with other executives in this industry is, um, you know, what about like compliance? with, uh, you know, there's a new term, ethical AI, that's, uh, that people are talking about. Like, you know, is the artificial intelligence that people are designing, is it, is it in a way that, that betters humanity, that betters the way that we live, that betters the way that we take care of our environment, or is it more destructive towards that? And so as you start to think about that, as, you know, there are 
um, voluntary, you know, organizations and councils about driving forward, you know, ethical artificial intelligence workloads. Um, you know, but I think as time goes by, there's going to become self-regulating bodies, maybe, um, you know, some maybe some government, uh, you know, regulatory committees towards, you know, towards things like that. And I think you know we need to be thinking about that. And you know, as while we talked about the network, um, while we talked about, you know, end users. You know, there are additional uh, pieces that are tied into a, into a data center that we can carry over. Things like you know, um, firewall technology or advanced firewall technology. Um, you know, encryption standards. Uh, you know, autonomy in terms of patching, in terms of you know, uh, building things out, provisioning and, and, and bringing down. Um, you know, those are all the things that we would probably do that most of us do inside of an enterprise data center that can be applied towards that. So I don't necessarily mean that that would be an additional cost, but it's definitely a consideration. Anything else that you, know, that you think might apply towards that, Ira? No, I think you covered that one. Great, cool, all right. So you know, I wanna ask you this question, right? I've posed a lot of different aspects of an AI-ready data center and the workloads that are, that are coming up. And you may not have ever run a computer vision AI workload or an NLP instance or anything like that. But, you know, you might be asking yourself, well, are we capable? Is my organization capable of being able to do something like this? And my answer to you is yes, absolutely. You most certainly can, you know. Um, you most certainly can reach out to, to Sterling. You know, we've... Uh, We've been in this business for several, over several decades. Our business is in, is in data center. We've evolved you know, across many different types of networks, many different types of storage uh, architectures, many different types of compute architectures. And uh, you know, we, we spend a lot of time with our customers in this space, but we also spend a lot of our time in the enterprise software space, and as well as emerging technologies. And, you know, and as I mentioned before, you got to do the work. You know, there's a lot of planning involved. There's a lot of understanding, uh, you know, what's going on inside the power and, and cooling side. What's going on inside of facilities management? What's going on inside of your existing, you know, infrastructure, your cabling, the, you know, the technologies that are being used. Can you reuse that, you know, um, before you even create that first AI workload? Um, you know, and if you don't know a lot about it right now, it's okay. You know, take the NVIDIA Deep Learning Institute uh, courseware, right? Um, NVIDIA's Launchpad will take you from zero to, you know, being able to run an AI workload. Um, inside of our solution center, we have the capability of being able to do that as well with you uh, and, and guide you through some of this work. And, and because of that, we created, you know, a, a AI-ready data center workshop where we do a little bit of a deeper dive into what we've, you know, what, what Ira and I have talked about uh, over the session. Um, and so what that allows us to do is give you a workshop that for, you know, a pretty short period of time, anywhere between half a day to a day, where you get to learn how to put all of this together and not just put it together on paper. You're gonna, you're gonna use the tools and you're gonna use our solution center and you're gonna use our launch pad in order to be able to, to do these. Um, where you're calculating the power and cooling of a particular scenario, where you're configuring that network and seeing what that network uh, you know, has to be in order to be able to pump that data and feed that beast, right? Um, optimize the storage, understand you know, where some of the pitfalls might be and understand how to be able to optimize the storage to be able to run an AI-ready workload. And then we're gonna build that environment. We're gonna build it and then once we are able to get a console and able to get into a shell prompt, uh, we're going to walk you through creating a workload and actually running it on this new AI-ready data center. Now, it's not gonna be huge, it's not gonna be like the picture I showed you, but it is going to have all of those aspects. And the reason why we're doing this is because it's really important that not only do we talk about all of these different aspects, but at Sterling, we're all about art of the how. We wanna make sure that our customers, that our NVIDIA customers understand not just what this technology is, but how to be able to apply it 
to be able to improve the efficiency and grow the business within your organization. Um, and for that, I thank you for the session. Ira, always a pleasure working with you, my friend. Uh, thank you for your insight. And, uh, and you know, I expect us to do many more of these to come.